Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad to be here and we're looking forward to hearing your questions. So get ready. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. And so my areas would be cut flowers and maybe even perennials, but I have three I think they're highly intelligent looking. I just noticed that this, that they're highly intelligent and they have great areas of expertise that I'd like for you to direct your questions in that area. So I think Chuck Voigt, let's start with you first. Okay, uh, I am Chuck Voigt. I'm from the Crop Sciences Department also in horticulture. Uh, my specialties are vegetables and herbs, uh, but I can comment on other things and often do. Uh, my, I have a question here that was sent in by Andy and the question is will gourds ripen on the vine on grass without rotting? And I would say generally speaking yes they will. Um, the Most of the pictures we have are of the small uh, cucurbita pipo uh, gourds and those are, are in the you know the what we're most familiar with pumpkins, that happens to be a, a winter luxury pumpkin that is an old uh, heirloom uh, pumpkin um, that's used, it apparently is very good for cooking. Uh, this is a, a Lagenaria type gourd, and that I call it dinosaur. Other people call it swan. Uh, if you grow them on a trellis so they're straight, you can call them a caveman's club. Um, as far as gourds rotting, uh, <sighs> They, they come on later in the season and usually we, you know, we're not really like we were in June this year. Um, so generally speaking, they're, 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 they're pretty good about not rotting, especially if they were growing out onto the grass. I think they would mm -hmm. be even better than if they're on bare soil. Um, I think we have a, had a picture of, uh, of a loofah, which might be a little more prone to, to that because mm -hmm. they don't... Uh, they ripen pretty late, and as they start to ripen, the, 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 the rind starts to deteriorate, so they might be sort of an issue. If you have any doubt, uh, especially on some of the larger ones, you can always put a little pad of straw or, or cardboard or something under them just to kind of give them a, uh, a little space. But generally speaking, they're, they're pretty good about, about just, you know, this dinosaur gourd was out in the field here and, and was just sitting on the dirt and was fine, as was this pumpkin. Um, so it should be a, 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 a large in, percent okay. Except in extreme circumstances, okay. like if September had been as wet as June was, then there, you could probably have an issue. And sometimes it's really still high humidity. We've dropped humidity now, so that maybe could. <clears throat> okay, well Andy, there is the answer to your question. Well, I'm gonna go next to you, Dr. Doug Williams. Hello everybody. I have two plants I brought with me today that are seasonally uh, in, of interest this time of year. One is the Osage Orange, which you see here, which is this large, uh, light green, um, round apple. You can't eat it, um, at least I wouldn't. I don't recommend it, but this time of year you can have, uh, you can decorate it. Um, you can actually draw, you know, a jack-o'-lantern's face on it and different things of that nature, and it won't, um, it can last up to a little bit over a week. I've had them in, I've used them uh, for a number of different things that way. And then they, you don't feel like you're wasting food because you can't eat it once it goes bad. I've even been told that it helps to um, cut down on some insects. So um, it might be popular also in the home in that sense. But be sure once it starts to go bad to throw it out. <clears throat> Another thing here is this is bayberry. Um, it's a semi evergreen bush. Uh, or northern bayberry has these wonderful um, waxy um, fruit structures that I've heard that you can make candles uh, with and it's fragrant um, even the stem is fragrant uh, even crushing the leaves is that way as well but um, I haven't made candles yet so I'll, I'll probably try that out one day but in the meantime you have to be sure to get a female plant to get these fruiting structures and you also of course have to have a male that's present amongst the uh, the plants you have in your home landscape. Those look nice just kind of grouped right there the way you've got it. That's very pretty. What an eye. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And lime green is still a big color for everything. You have to pick a lot of those berries and, and cook them before you're going to have enough for a candle. <laughs> I think <Yeah>. so. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks great. So thank you, Doug. And now it's on to you, Shane Coultra. 
Hi, I'm Shane Coulter. I'm one of the family of owners of Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana, Illinois, and where are we? we're called Coulter Nurseries in Onarga, Illinois as well. I, we, we grow as a company, we grow perennials, trees, shrubs, so I can answer all those kind of questions as well as landscaping and um, pretty much anything that grows in central Illinois, I, I probably grow a little bit of. So I have a show and tell today, and something that's not hardy to this area is a succulent called Echeveria. And Echeveria is, is you, you probably don't realize how many different Echeverias there are, but you can see that this one is called Mother of Thousands. And you can see why it's called that is every single plant here is gonna be a brand new plant. And every time you touch it, it drops oh, all over the place. Thanks, Shane. Those are for Diane, I have more for you guys <laughs> later. But you can take this little plant and put it in a little thing of soil and this will become this plant. Matter of fact, uh, Julie at work bought one plant and grew our hundreds of them from that one plant. So they do, they are pretty prolific. They are not hardy. They need to come in and be a house plant, but they're really easy to grow. We hardly ever water this thing and it gets real. The bigger the pot, the bigger the plant. So it's just a beautiful plant, fun to play around with. Can't really kill it and you can grow lots of more plants for it. And it won't spread all over the world here in central Illinois because it won't live over the winter. So you don't have to worry about you know, invasive species or anything. So this is a pretty cool plant, Echeveria or Mother of Thousands, it's called. It's really got a great leaf. I thought that was really pretty. So now I have six new yeah, plants. Yeah. <laughs> Next week you'll be growing all on my in clipboard. The <laughs> 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 Thank you, Shane, Thanks. very much. We're going to go next to our Did You Know feature. The total length of roots and root hairs of a single rye plant is 7,000 miles. The roots grow over three miles per day in search of microorganisms. Okay, let's go next to our phone lines. We're going to start first with Liz's call about orchids, and it's on line three. Hi, Liz. Line three. I'm not Liz, but I had a question about orchids. Okay, well, what's your name? <laughs> My name is Ruth. Okay, Ruth, what's your question? Um, I was given an orchid as a um, present in April mm -hmm. last year. And it was all in bloom, and it stayed in bloom until August. And now the bloom's all dropped off, and I have never had an orchid, have no idea how to take care of it, other than water it once a week with ice cubes. And mm -hmm. so what, does it bloom again? How long does it take it to bloom? Do I need to repot it? It's okay. in a small pot. Well, I'll take a little bit of it and then you guys can jump in. I have done the same thing where you get the orchid and I think mine were dendrobium orchids that you water with the ice cube. The reason they say the ice cube is because uh, people in, in the home generally overwater to the killing point of most plants. And so the orchid being watered with the ice cube makes you water it less. So once a week is great. I don't repot it. Uh, orchids do fine for a long time. I've got uh, one orchid that's in its original pot that I think I've had 10 years. Um, closer to the time when it flowered before. Now mine are on a more winter January to April schedule. So maybe yours was flowered a little bit out of season, but I would see if it's going to send up a shoot in January or February, uh, then you can cut those shoots back and it may partially back and it may form another flower shoot, which might be nice. And then during uh, the year, you might give it a quarter strength fertilizer every so often. I've never done that. Mine have always flowered, you know, once a year, but it's really pretty easy. Don't worry about the tendrils, the rootlets, um, just water it once a week. Anything I've forgotten that you want to fill yes. in? Summer vacation outdoors, if you can. You can do that. Uh, in, a, <clears throat> in a not real sunny place, especially when you first take it out, mm -hmm. uh, they really tend to you know, make a lot of energy that, that makes them more prone it's to flower than when you get into later in the season. Uh, mine inside, <clears throat> I haven't taken mine out, but it's in an east window so it doesn't get overly a lot of sun. So Liz, I mean, Ruth, there you go. Uh, hope you have a good time reflowering your orchid. <clears throat> Let's go next to Sammy's question about crabgrass and we're gonna go to line four. Hi, Sammy. Uh, my question is about crabgrass. I, uh, my yard was uh, infested this year. Oh yeah. I guess from the neighbor or something, but sprayed it, killed all the grass, but now I have the brown spots in the yard. So 
I burn that up, or how do I get rid of it? Okay, who wants to be our crabgrass specialist? In which part was brown, just brown patches or brown? Where you killed the crabgrass? Like killed, yeah. yeah. killed the, the crabgrass. Or, or maybe, yeah. may, maybe it just froze, I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> well, if it's, if it's brown, it's probably dead because things haven't gone dormant quite yet this time of year. Um, the problem this year was we didn't get rain and usually like a little dampness before you put the crab mm -hmm. grass killer and preventer uh, down if, it, if it's a granular type and a lot of people burn it because they put it down and it kind of sat there and, and just kind of burnt things. I, it's hard to tell which, what you did because it would burn a lot of area. It wouldn't just burn the crabgrass. So maybe you did get the crabgrass and maybe it's dead and that'll eventually just disappear over the winter and holes will open up and you need the seed to fill those holes because as we say, uh, nature will fill the holes for you with weeds if you don't get so it So that'll grass. be in spring. That'll be in spring. Right. It's a little late. Don't, don't look at the uh, road mm -hmm. people right now that are spraying seed down in the middle of October. That's more on a contract than on reality that it's going to grow. <laughs> right. So I, I and, noticed that this year. And then try the grab, crabgrass preventer right. next year. And that's, year. that's soil temperature yeah. uh, is how you, how you figure that. Is it like before it's 55 degrees soil temperature or yeah, something? Yeah, exactly. So when, when you see the, the first industrious farmers out putting in corn seed, I think 55 is about their, yeah. their target. Uh, so that's when you want to get it down because past that, they're gonna, it's going to start to germinate and then it's not effective. Yeah. Oh my, it was the year of the crabgrass. It was really a good year for yeah. it. So you're well, not alone. Most of the Midwest got a lot of rain and well, the, mm -hmm. most of the nation got a lot of rain and right. everything grew well. Mostly weeds. Okay, so we're with you there on the crabgrass situation. Now we're going to go on to Marsha's questions about roses, and we're on line five. Hi, Marsha. Hi, this is Marsha. Um, I have was given in late June when I moved a potted, big potted knockout rose, and I need to know whether I bring it in, what the winter care is for it, so I can. And it's still in the pot. Yes. Okay. Well, I would have planted it, I yeah. think. Um, I, still would, I still would plant it versus bring it in inside. It is not a house plant. It is. And it's not really too late. It's no, not. No, no, you could it's plant. Close. It's not ideal. It's, yeah, it's getting, <clears throat> it's getting close to that time, but it's still okay to plant a knockout. It's one of the hardier, even though they've struggled in the winters. I, this is what I tell people on knockout roses. One, I say watered in well going into winter mulch it in well going into winter. Don't cut it back to a foot. Don't cut it back hard because again, Mother Nature will knock it back for you. It will take a foot off, two foot or half of it off. And if you've cut it to short, that means you're subjecting it. We say, we say just trim it a little bit. Just make yourself feel comfortable that it looks nice. Just take a little tips off of it. Um, and, and I'll even take some compost and volcano it up around the base of the plant to cover as much of the base as I can. So even if the whole top dies, I still have eight inches of plant that was uh, protected with the compost. And then I'll push the compost back and use it as mulch and amend the soil with it. So that's what we do. I will not lie. It has been a tough knockout three years in a row. Mm -hmm. Been a lot of loss on them. If it's been in a pot that long, you want to look at the roots too and make sure they're not that's circling. True and either feather them out or, or cut them on a couple of sides so that you don't have strangling roots down the, yeah. down the road. I will say that sales have been so good in the nursery industry that has been less of a problem than ever. And, and that's not joking. That's because they're plants, fresh. Because they're fresh mm -hmm. and they're selling yeah. millions of knockout roses <coughs> and uh, you're gonna see more because Ball Seed just bought knockout roses. So you've got a hundred million I dollar see. company investing in a big brand name. So excellent. Yeah, it's going to be a big machine. Yeah. I did not know yeah. that. That's excellent. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much for your question on roses. We're going to go next to Stephanie's question about native trees on line six. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Diane. What's your question? Well, I have a couple acres out in the country and I want to plant some native trees, and I've gone looking for white oak, sassafras, and catalpa, and I haven't been able to find them. Okay, well, I know that white oak is available through the state as far as, but you have to buy a lot of them, and they have them bare root, so white oak is usually bare root, which is probably why you don't find it in a native, so, in a local. 
So White Oak you can get through the uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, I believe that's correct. Yeah. The or the state the, foresters. The state main foresters. reason you don't see them in a, in a production nurture, nursery like ours is they don't transplant well. That's exactly right. They, you know, we sell trees that are tend to be two inches across caliper and eight or 10 feet tall. And a white oak is probably five times a loss rate. And we do carry white oak. We, we only grow 20 or so a year. But normally if I dig 20 trees, I might lose one on white oak. I'm gonna lose five to 10 of those because they do not like the taproot cut. Sassafras is in the exact same, same thing. category. Mm -hmm. And for uh, as a nursery, I know it's hard to believe, but we actually try and make money and do it next Whoa. year. And those loss <laughs> rates don't allow us to do that. So that's why you're gonna see them more in containers and get them young and people don't do them in numbers. I mean, we, we wanna sell things that a lot of people want and people think that yeah, a lot of people want sassafras. The same four people are always the ones that call, we notice. And, and that's why you don't see it quite as often. Is the people that want those are the most vocal. And you think, and I, you heard me say this the other day, that you think, well, four people want it, 100 people want it. No, those are the same four people looking for sassafras. Now, I had a great thing happen, and, and I put mulch down, and I had, in two different spots, a sassafras tree yeah. come up in the mulch. So I have two trees on site, and I'm gonna to try to move them before they're a, a foot tall. I meant to do it this fall, but they just don't transplant. And a catalpa, yeah. look around. Big. Catalpas, if you see one catalpa tree, just look on the ground, they'll Take be Take a seed pod, you'll seed never seed. ever be able to control a catalpa after. Yeah, it's, but they're nice, you just don't want But you can grow more. them from seed really easily. Very easy from our seed. Field, yeah. One came up an inch from my sidewalk from <laughs> the tree I had, so I, have, I actually weed catalpa at my house. So I do have all three. What <laughs> other native trees might? Osage orange. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Doug, Osage orange. Well, hedge apple is what it's also called. So that's a native, and it's a very good wood material. Hard insect resistant. wood. It takes a lot of uh, different conditions, drought, um, some moist areas, uh, sun, shade. Um, it's a tough plant, so it's one that you definitely can uh, enjoy um, for I years to come. It's extremely guesses. thorny, particularly when it's young. Yeah, I have Grandpa Gus's Osage orange Which can be, which can be good home. or bad, depending yeah, on yeah, what your aim is. Yeah. Well, I live mine protection. up quite high so that it doesn't hurt yeah. the person mowing near it. And persimmon, people are always looking for mm -hmm. the same people that want the, the pawpaw tree, the persimmon, all this, it's the same <laughs> category of people. But, you know, there's a great nursery. If you're ever going down south, there's a place called Forest Keeling that is known across oh, the nation yes. as the mm -hmm. place to eat your native trees. You can take, you can put a couple containers in your back of your car and get 10 of them back there and get everything you need. It's worth a trip down there. There's it also is. some mail order places. Yeah, that, lots that, of mail order, have, but there you can th see th them. Th that, have, that have lots of, of cultivars yeah. of pawpaw and persimmon yeah. and, and a lot of the natives. And yeah. Kentucky <coughs> coffee tree, isn't yeah. that? Yeah, and those we grow a lot a native. of. Yeah. That's a black tupelo is yeah. sure. another good one. Um, and then uh, black locust too, right? Is that, that's a pretty yes, nice, a nice fragrance. Yes, very. Prolific, huh? Very overly prolific. Yeah. <laughs> Tends to root sucker a bit too, I yeah. Oh my goodness. <coughs> to make sure my eyes are just bugging out because well, if you of, have yeah. a fireplace, you have <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> That was why my neighbor planted it originally, because it was good firewood, but they moved. Yeah. So yeah. it's available, and, and, and nurseries like myself should probably do more uh, yeah. of the, those type of trees. Just be diligent, and you, you can probably track them yeah. down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, exactly. So just a few every year and, and visit others. And if people have woods, I'm sure they would share the seeds for some of these with you. Boy, we loved that question. Thank <coughs> you so much, Stephanie. Let's go to Tom's question next on line seven. And this is about mulch. I know we're going to love this question. <coughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, Diane. I just love your show. Thank hey, you. I've got a big question. Is, I've, I've been hearing so many theories on mulch. Uh, some people say the best is straw. Some people say, no, the best is go to the gas stations and get the wooden mulch. Other people say, no, that's not the good stuff either. Go out in your backyard, mulch all your leaves up, and put it around your flowers and your shrubs. That is the best. Which is the best? Okay, we have four people here. Let's, let's talk to all four of us. Chuck, you want to start? Um, <clears throat> I would say that the, the gas station things are probably not at the top of my list. Uh, they tend to blow around and wash around and not be, t never ever give away your leaves or burn them, you know, chop them up and use them. 
If you have that, it's a great resource. It's full of nutrients that the trees have drawn up from deep. Um, compost is great. Um, straw is is really low in nitrogen, although if 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 that's what you have, it, it can work for some things. Um, the if, if you catch the, the power company out murdering trees. <laughs> uh, Trimming trees from people who planted their trees too close to, close to power lines? Yeah. Is that what you meant? No, I'm not married to a tree trimmer, so <laughs> I don't have to say that. <coughs> um, it, th that stuff is pretty good because it tends to have enough mm. sap and, and, and green stuff in it, so the carbon-nitrogen ratio isn't as terrible as it would be if it were uh, some of the other things that are almost all carbon and almost no nitrogen, so they, they yellow things up like crazy as, as they try to break down. Right. Doug, do you have a favorite mulch? Whatever is nearby, whatever you have. Um, I agree with that, too. That's yeah. whatever you have. I, I'm a hardwood bark guy just because of the thickness and the heaviness seems to protect a little better. The straw is always in my yard from my neighbor's yard, so, the, the, you know, that, that's not true. But straw can get a little dry and, and, and blow around a little bit. But hardwood mulch stays down. It's thick. It breaks down into good soil, protects the plant really well. So I, I think that, or, or a really fine wood product that, again, is a heavier, mm -hmm. heavier mulch. So I, I like the heavier substances uh, or a composed leaf, decomposed leaf. But if you can get it heavy, I, I like it. I agree about not sending your leaves away. I let those kind of collect in areas and, you know, you can't really put those on some of your things, they just mat down. So it's breaking them up into smaller pieces. They blow into my mulch that's already there and then they do a great job. But I do like the hardwood mulches, the, and I let them age. And I'm, I'm talking two to six months aging. Okay. So, and I mulch everything. I probably mulch every week of the year unless the mulch is physically frozen together. Yeah. Every week of the year. I get to know neighbors yeah. by being I out there mulching. I see I know that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it just keeps down weeds, it keeps in moisture, it's, it makes sassafras seeds grow up and be moist and then I can <laughs> transplant. So I get a lot of other plants, sometimes I don't want them. Yeah, M mine must be a female because I've got little seedling sassafrases around where they can't be root suckers. Really? Mm. Uh oh, you're gonna get some phone calls. <laughs> Plant sale. <laughs> Great, that sounds like a wonderful deal. Well, we're gonna do another question. Let's go to Mary's question on line three and it's about orchids. Hi, Mary. Hello. What's your question? Well, when you were talking about orchids, I have an orchid that you know came from the grocery store. Yes. And I've had it um, since last um, February or so, and the blooms have long since gone. And now I have four very green shoots growing straight up. And are those flower buds? Okay, green shoots. And they're coming up straight out of the, you know, the potting. They're not the coming potting. off the leaf itself? No. No. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to them right now to double check. Because <laughs> normally, you know, you've got your couple or maybe four leaves, and then that shoot will come from the leaves. The center. Oh, yeah. The center, yeah, yeah. right. from the center of the leaf. Well, let me let me look and see because, but <coughs> otherwise, I mean, are those it, air it, roots green sometimes? Well, these are real green. Oh no, it's coming right up from the from the center of the leaves. Oh, yeah. Well, you're in for it. So those are yeah. buds. Sounds like, like you've done something right. You are yeah. doing great. Well, I put my three ice cubes. Well, I have See? one, two, three, four of them. Five. Four, <laughs> five at once. <laughs> so, so, well, so do nothing, just enjoy them. So you just them. called to brag is what you're saying. <laughs> That's, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, That's great. The issue, the issue is, um, at some point, should I cut some of these bud stems off so that the other ones will really turn into flowers? My answer would be no. Leave yeah. them alone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when they get too tall, then I've got and little holders to put in. There you go. Sounds That's like a plan. fantastic. Wow, you are doing great. 
So it's the three ice cubes, folks. In yeah. other words, it's the not overwatering. You can always email us a picture right. too. Sure. If you want to brag a little more. That's sure. right. Because the, the common ones are epiphytic, and and the roots are to hang on to things. They're not really to soak up water to any great degree. Mm -hmm. So right, and so that's why they come out, and people think I want to cut those off. No, just leave them. But that is very impressive. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, well, we're going to go to the mag quiz feature next. The shade and wind buffering provided by trees reduces annual heating and cooling costs in the U.S. by how much? A, 2.1 million, B, 21 million, C, 212 million, D, 2.1 billion. D, 2. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Goodbye.